Thank you for joining Collective Sun and our webinar, Shining Light on the Inflation Reduction Act, What You Need to Know. Get excited, we'll be unpacking the upcoming positive changes coming from signing of the Inflation Reduction Act. As a reminder, this is an educational webinar. Uh, so listen for the facts and what we found, but uh, don't count on everything because things can change at any time. I'd love to introduce you to our speakers today, both joining us from sunny San Diego, Thank you, Danielle, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, Nicole, we have the best marketing team ever, don't we? Let's. Uh, we do. Thank I you, think Danielle. I gave them a round of applause earlier. So Our issue another. director of marketing and communications, <laughs> we appreciate all you do. Uh, my name's Lee. I'm a co-founder at Collective Sun and a CPA and lead accredited professional. And Nicole, we were asked to share a fun fact about ourselves, <laughs> which... <laughs> I, I asked, what, what's a fun fact? Right. And, and I was told, well, our, our last webinar, our uh, colleague, Matt Brennan, uh, shared his fun fact was, I like cats. That's cool. <laughs> um, that's a fun fact. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and Matt, if you're watching, uh, there is a, a photo of a cat somewhere in the slide. So let's see if you can spot that. Special um, treat for Matt. For Matt. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't have a fun fact. Instead, I decided to do a confession. So here it is for our, our audience. I watched the full 27 hours of Senate floor debate on the passage of the IRA, and I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating popcorn and cheering C-SPAN. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, a fun fact or under the category of, <laughs> you know, you're an accounting nerd if <laughs> watch 27 hours of Senate floor debate. Uh, and uh, with that, Nicole, do you have any any fun facts or confessions you'd, you'd like to make for our audience? So I want to just add one fine detail to the this confession that you've made about watching 27 hours of Senate floor debate. Not only did he watch it, he issued play by play as if it were a sport. So yeah. that's the complete confession. Sorry, I had to tack that on there. Um, I, I'll own it. I'll I, own okay. it. <laughs> We've all come to the conclusion that Matt may be the most entering, interesting or creative of the three of us. But my fun fact is that I'm, I'm not a San Diego native. I hail from a tiny little town in Amish country, Worcester, Ohio. And, and just before uh, coming to San Diego recently, I did have a stop off a little while in Kentucky. So making my way back to the sunny state of California. And I have to confess, I am enjoying every moment of the weather. Uh, but that's about as exciting as I get, unfortunately. Um, other than being the director of sales at Collective Sun and having had the pleasure of working with this exciting team for over four years now and with all the wonderful nonprofits that uh, come our way for guidance and support. And with that, uh, without further ado, I guess we could get started if you want to advance the slide, and you already did. Um, today's webinar is really an opportunity to take a look at highlights and the newly signed IRA, the positive impacts to the nonprofit solar journey. So we will share our observations, address your questions as best we can, given what we know at this point in time. Next slide. And really today's webinar agenda is to introduce Collective Sun, if you're not familiar with us, discuss some key takeaways from the IRA, closer look at direct pay, offer a sneak peek into some new solutions Collective Sun is working on to continue our mission of serving nonprofits going solar. And then we'll get to the meat and potatoes, that kind of Q&A opportunity, which in my opinion is always the most impactful portion of a webinar. All right, let's get started. Who is Collective Sun? Great question. Collective Sun is a solar finance company. We are dedicated to serving nonprofit and tax exempt organizations. We've been connecting nonprofits with capital for their solar projects since 2011, and we continue to do that today. So the passing of the IRA brings change to the solar and solar finance industry, as well as more options for nonprofits going solar. So our role really remains the same to help nonprofits navigate their solar journey. And let's see here. So we've partnered with just shy of 200 nonprofit organizations who chose to go solar and save with Collective Sun. And not only are we very proud of that, but as you can imagine, we're very familiar with the challenges nonprofits face when they go solar. 
Because of that familiarity, we've done our level best to make ourselves an easy button, if you will, for the nonprofit solar journey. All right, drum roll, please. And next slide, if you will, Mr. Barkin. Cute confetti, balloons, fireworks, whatever you got. <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act is signed. So, so now what? The bill is signed. So now what? So, so first, we we take a moment to kind of acknowledge how monumental this is. I, I've heard people mention this is, is a big deal. No, the, the, the Guns N' Roses reunion tour was a big deal. This is monumental. This is transformative. Uh, this is the best thing since sliced anything uh, and, and really should be, uh, you know, admired as such on the hard work of so many organizations and people across the country. Um, Nicole, did, did you have a reaction or, or well, how, how did you absorb this news when you, you were watching the, the live streaming, I guess? Uh, I am going to, this is my confession moment, I guess. I actually had tears in my eyes. I'm, I'm not going to say that I was hard for cried, but I was extremely moved. I thought it was very exciting. It's hard to work in the space that we work in and not be really moved by this incredible change and opportunity. And the the magnitude of three hundred and sixty nine billion dollars of climate investments to invest in our future, um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. I mean, we used to joke about a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon it's real money. But three hundred and sixty nine billion, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to picture or imagine what that looks like. And maybe one of our intrepid audience participants can can tell us uh, if you stacked a hundred dollar <laughs> bills. You know, how many Statue of Liberties does that, you know, equivalent to or um, it, it's significant, like like it is it is monumental. It is, it, is a, it is more than a big deal. So, you know, what's in it? Well, 740 pages has a lot of stuff, but we're really going to distill that down into the pieces that are interesting for nonprofits and, and kind of working our way around <clears throat> around the horn. <clears throat> so exciting. It's getting me choked up. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's a tax credit extension for 10 years plus, and, and the plus, it could go more than 10 years. So in 2032, there could be, um, you know, it's even beyond that, but a 30% uh, full restored credit, that's huge. There's bonus credits, there's adders uh, that we're, we're going to talk about. Battery storage just became a whole lot simpler. So batteries qualified under the old pre-IRA ITC but it was super complicated. So it had to be installed with an energy system and it had to be powered with electrons coming from the sun over a certain percentage. And if you dropped under that percentage, it became dual use property. There were all these technicalities and those kind of disappear. Now, if you've already deployed solar, you could add storage on top and still get a, a tax credit. So it, it's gonna simplify that process and make it much easier for people to include battery storage or add battery storage to their solar projects. Transferability is a bit of an unknown. At first, a lot of folks were really excited about this, and the concept of transferability addresses the challenge that we had pre-IRA. The IRS did not allow you to, quote, sell a tax credit. They had different mechanisms that allowed us to transfer an asset with tax attributes attached to them. So we had all these fancy partnership flips and sale leasebacks and inverted leases and a really complicated structures. But at the end of the day, all they were really trying to do is get a tax credit from point A to point B. And now the IRS is saying, hey, here's a pathway. You can transfer them. You can now sell a tax credit. So that on the surface was very exciting, but the bill is silent on any kind of component about the eligibility to receive the tax credit, to be the transferee. So if the rules are the same as they used to be that we're familiar with, and for those fellow accounting nerds at home, I'm talking about the passive activity loss limitation rules and the at-risk rules, all those complexities, if they're still in place, transferability is not that exciting. So <laughs> we're waiting for guidance to find out uh, whether or not those restrictions on who can receive that tax credit are going to be the same. If they're the same, all that really does is let you transfer the credit without all of those extra accounting gymnastics, which you know, were material. Those were a couple hundred thousand dollars of accounting and legal fees on top of a transaction. So it would be good, but it may not be as market transformational as people think, unless we get guidance, you know, to the contrary. Uh, and that's the last I'm going to say about transferability, because it also turns out if you're eligible for direct pay, if you're a nonprofit, 
you're not eligible for transferability. So if you were one of those uh, folks who thought like, I'll just transfer this credit to a parishioner or, you know, that, that's probably not going to work. Uh, direct pay is the more exciting area, but it too has its own, you know, limitations and caveats. So before we jump into that, let's, let's talk a little bit about timing. Um, the bill is retroactive in the sense that the 30% ITC applies to projects that were placed in service uh, in 2022, uh, which means, hey, if uh, if you are a residential customer, say, and you put solar on your roof at home and you got uh, at the time, and let's say it's uh, January, so you built this solar project, put it on your roof, it's January, you're done, you're excited, you were expecting to get to the end of the year and file your taxes and claim a 26% tax credit, because at the time you built that system, that's what the rule was. The IRA is going to say retroactively, all those folks who are going to file their taxes this year that put a solar system up are going to be eligible for a 30% ITC. So bonus, free bonus for all those folks who did the right thing. Uh, it didn't necessarily incentivize any of that behavior, but if you already did it, you know, you're going to achieve this bonus. The other provisions, the ones, you know, we're interested here on this conversation, um, the bonus adders and direct pay, you know, transferability storage. Those are all projects placed in service next year. So if you're a food bank um, and you have a project that is about to be placed in service on December 31st, if that day ends up you know, being a holiday and, they, and the workers come back on January 1st and complete that system and place it in service, that system now qualifies for direct pay. So a system placed in service in 2022 may not be as advantageous as a system placed in service in 2023 if you are going to elect one of these other provisions like bonus adders, direct pay, standalone storage, so on. Um, that might result in a slowdown for some, some projects. We're just not sure yet. But there's other reasons you might want to speed up. Uh, for example, there are new labor requirements. So those are prevailing wage requirements and apprenticeship requirements those are significant um, and will add cost to a project um, also, and also have the benefits of, of prevailing wage. Um, but be aware that there is a 60-day window after guidance is published by Treasury. That means if you start construction today, you're eligible for the full 30%, regardless of the labor requirements, if you meet them or you don't. The moment that guidance is published, you've got 60 days to start your project. If you don't start your project in those 60 days, you are going to be subject to these new labor requirements. If your project is under a megawatt, don't worry about it. You're exempt. That's not something you have to be concerned about. All right, let's hop into bonus adders. So these are really cool. These are on top of the 30% and they're stackable, which means you can increase incrementally if you qualify for each of these bonus adders. The first one is domestic content. So that means if your equipment has a Made in the USA sticker on it, you can qualify for an extra 10%. The question's gonna come up, what is Made in the USA? What does that mean? We're, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more on uh, another slide, but uh, you know, functionally it is all of the steel and iron and 40% of a manufactured good has to have US parts in it in the first year, and that's gonna go up over time. So this is you know, Congress saying, we're going to incentivize a US manufacturing base by giving you a 10% bonus credit for using made in USA products. And there's other areas in this bill, which we're not gonna to touch on today, that stimulate domestic manufacturing in other ways. So we're going to see a lot of renewed interest in made in USA products. The second bonus adder is called energy communities. This should really more properly be labeled something like legacy energy communities, because th this is you know places that are currently centers for coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, they're getting a little bonus. Now, at first you might say, well, this is, this is Manchin, Senator Manchin, like building in uh, benefits for his constituency. And, and on some side that might be true, but Holistically, uh, we also have to recognize that in the energy transition, there are communities that will be disproportionately affected as we convert from legacy energy sources to newer energy sources. So, so this is a great provision that's going to give a bonus 
if you install solar in one of these communities that, that are you know, uh, affected by this transition. Um, there's a bunch of details about how that works. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to email me if you have you know, questions about some of the nuanced details. But um, the challenge with energy community right now is there is no map you can go to. The, the code, the, you know, the bill text literally says an area, <laughs> and that's not defined yet. Uh, to, you know, to be defined by the secretary, uh, at least for the areas, you know, with a coal mine closed or a coal uh, plant closed, they're using census track in the language. But there isn't a map, uh, you know, that that's going to lay out and show you all of these places uh, today. I, I imagine people are going to develop those. And there's going to be a lot of questions and answers and guidance coming out of Treasury. They're going to be really busy. Uh, over the next several months in the rulemaking process. Now, shifting gears to the low-income community, this is a slightly different credit because it's an allocated credit in a manner to be determined by the secretary, meaning we don't know how they're going to be allocated. We know there's going to be 1.8 gigawatts per year, and they can carry over from a year to the next, but we don't really know. Is there going to be an application? You got to get an approval. Does this happen you know, before you construct, after? like? it's kind of unknown. Um, but the parts we do know are that it can be either 10% or 20% bonus. So the 10% is for Native American land qualifies and any kind of low income. Uh, for the definition of low income, check out 45D. This is standard well-worn territory. If you've ever done like new markets tax credit work, the, the standard definitions are, are well known and understood. It's basically 20% or higher um, uh, poverty rate or 80% AMI, there, there's certain rules uh, in a census track, and you can go to a map today. There's several. You can put in an address. They'll tell you, yes, no, this qualifies, doesn't qualify under 45D. So you could tell today if, if your project's going to be eligible, but what you don't know today is the process to apply for this and receive approval for it inside this 1.8 gigawatt per year allocation. The other pathway in the low-income community is a more nuanced, oh, it's been an hour, there's some new definitions around these two terms, you can Google them, but functionally think about it as affordable housing projects, like multi-tenant unit projects with um, uh, you know, affordable housing uh, kind of model where power is being delivered for the benefit of individual tenants. Uh, so, so dig into those. If you have questions, of course, send, send me an email, but those are kind of the three pathways. You get 10% for domestic content, 10% for being in a legacy energy community, and 10% for being in a low-income community, or 20% for uh, affordable housing project. Wow. Imagine if you're in um, you know, a, a project in Appalachia that uses made in USA panels that is an affordable housing project, like you could be talking about a 60% ITC. Um, th that's significant. Uh, and that, that's going to stimulate a, a lot of solar growth in new parts of our of the country that may not have, you know, enjoyed that before. Okay, so let's hop into direct pay and percentages. So this is something not a lot of people are talking about right now, but it's really important to point out. I just described direct pay as being this kind of carrot like you do these things and you get a 10 percent bonus use products that have a made in the usa sticker on them and you get more itc there's also a provision that says there's a phase out of the direct pay eligibility unless you use the made in usa products so in 2023 doesn't matter it's 100 percent for everybody if you're a food bank and you're eligible for direct pay, you can get 100% of that direct pay payment from the IRS, uh, from Department of Treasury, and uh, there, there's no condition upon using Made in USA products. But let's say we get out, uh, and this is a startup construction, so let's say you start your project in 2024, same food bank. If they're not using Made in USA product, then they're only going to get 90% of that amount. Now, the caveat here, this is only for projects that are over a megawatt. So if you're under a megawatt, 
take a deep breath, relax. You're, you're not, this is not going to be applicable to you. Now, there may be lots of other really good reasons why you want to use Made in USA products, and you could be eligible for a 10% bonus adder. But you're not going to be penalized um, if you are under a megawatt. If you're over a megawatt, you really want to pay attention to these. Okay, so I keep talking about Made in USA. And I'm sure someone's asking, well, what does that mean? How do you get that sticker that says Made in the USA? Um, the hint here is Google Part 661 uh, in the CFR. You'll, you'll find a ton of details. The good news is that even though this bill is light on details, it references 661. We've been here before as an industry. We've had Buy America requirements. And there is a wealth of literature and court cases that can illuminate and guide us for, for what that's going to look like. Um, but do keep in mind that this is a moving target. So for the first two years, for that you know, product to have a Made in America sticker on it in 2023 and 2024, only 40% of the the domestic content has to come from the US. Because if you think about the US right now with manufacturing, you cannot buy certain components, cells, polysilicon, wafers, like there's, there's a lot of upstream parts you can't even get yet. So this bill is creating incentives for those upstream industries to develop, and soon you will be able to buy those as manufacturers. So the whole supply chain now has these incentives. And what this bill is saying is that if you want to get, you know, qualify and get this bonus credit and qualify for this domestic content, you know, only 40% today, 40% 2024, but that's going to ratchet up to 45, 50, 55. However, 100% of the steel uh, is, is going to be required to come from the U.S. in order to qualify for that domestic content eligibility. And trust me, there will be dozens of questions that people are going to ask. What if my domestic content uh, component includes a piece of iron in it? <laughs> and does that have to, like, there will be lots of Q&A and there's entire bodies of law and, and um, uh, you know, that's developed around this space. So, so, you know, if you have questions, send an email, but, but just be aware, you know, you're not alone. There's a lot of people engaged in this conversation. Oh, is that a question, Nicole? I have a question, Mr. Barkin. Yes. Um, so when we we know that we're talking about steel and iron as far as domestic content, we're, are we, other than that, outside of the steel and iron, are we, strictly speaking, panels and inverters, or is it every single line item component of a solar system? Yeah, so so this is going to be, uh, like, another great question. Um, I, I hope you're writing these down. Uh, for submittal to the Department of Treasury. But functionally, um, they're looking for the entire project to have a Made in USA, you know, each component to have a Made in USA label on them. But the individual product, like a, certainly that's modules and that's inverters. So today, you know, a module is going to have cells and EVA and back sheet and glass, and it's a frame. And what they're what they're looking for is forty percent of that to come from domestic sources. Now you probably want to ask what forty percent of what is that? Forty percent of the surface area, forty percent of the weight, you know, forty percent of what? And and it's it it sounds like it's going to be forty percent of the cost. So forty percent of the cost is in uh, you know diodes or like if it's the components that go into it, I, I think that's going to drive. The eligibility, um, but one way or another, there's going to have to be some, um, uh, you know, made in USA sort of standard, and this will create challenges, um, particularly for, uh, you know, if you are interested in that transferability side, you're going to have to indemnify that if you claim this eligibility that you actually were eligible, because under audit, if you lose that, then there's a potential, you know, for risk. So, you know, this is going to be highly, highly debated and discussed in the accounting nerd circles. I, I'd say stay, stay tuned as, as this sort of evolves. But the good news is we, we've been here before as an industry. There's been other, you know, provisions in, in years past that had these requirements. So I think we're pretty well equipped. It's not as unknown as some of the other places in the bill. So 
some of the challenges, direct pay is super exciting, um, but be aware of some of the caveats involved here. The, the biggest one is really the lack of guidance. We have a period right now where there's bill provisions that have a lot of open-ended, you know, subject to interpretation areas. We're hearing that treasuries, you know, gonna could take four to six months to come out with any kind of guidance. And the the rules themselves are not enacted for a minimum uh, of 180 days anyway. So, so you can't actually claim direct pay on January 1st of uh, 2023. I think it's February 12th, uh, that's the, ninth, the 180 day uh, celebration day. Um, and, and even then that is a no sooner than date. In theory, it could go beyond that. We, we just don't know when the treasury department will both issue guidance and officially accept an election to claim direct pay. They're just unknowns at this time. So if you have a project that's about to be completed, like waiting six months might might be problematic. Um, and, and so that's an issue. Talk to us about that. We have some solutions. The concept of direct pay in the solar universe is, is new. And I, I just want to point out that this is different than the cash grant program that the industry enjoyed. Uh, it was called the Treasury 1603 grant program in 2009. In that program, the treasury gave you a form and said, in lieu of a tax credit, you can claim a cash grant. Well, that was great uh, for a period of time, um, but it came with a whole bunch of stipulations. For example, there were CPA review requirements. You had to hire a CPA to perform an attestation engagement to submit the application to, to the uh, IRS. Like It, it was, um, it, it had some complexities to it. The good thing was it came with a rule that said Treasury had to write you a check within 60 days. So this bill is not cash grant. <laughs> and so you're not going to get a check in 60 days from the Treasury. Uh, we don't know how it's going to work exactly. Um, but if they wanted to create a cash grant program, I imagine the will of Congress would have been to write it in. They, they did not do that in this case. We, we have this construct called, uh, you know, it's direct pay or, or elective credit uh, or elective payments uh, in the bill text. Um, you know, a, a lot remains to be seen. Like the filing requirements are kind of unknown. There's a lot of haziness around how exactly this is going to work. So we, we have to wait and see. Um, this could be a one page form that they, you know, release and it could be very complicated with auto requirements. We, we just don't know yet, um, but there's, uh, you, you know, a couple of, uh, well, we'll forget there, there, there's more here. Um, th they can make it really difficult. So this is straight out of the bill text. Uh, the secretary may require such information or registration as, as they deem necessary. So whatever they want to do, they basically get to write the rules and, and it doesn't seem like they're going to make this easy. Um, they have some legitimate concerns. They want to avoid fraud and duplication and, and things like that. Um, and, and those are reasonable, but how they in, how they actually promulgate those rules will be interesting. If you watched the development of the IRA, it has its roots in the Build Back Better bill. And if you watch the evolution of the BBB, there were things that were put in, like to claim direct pay, you had to submit the serial numbers of each panel and the industry lost its mind. Like there's no way we can track all that. And so that got taken out. And there were back and forth and iterations. And, and now we have direct pay, but how exactly it's going to be implemented is really something of an unknown. Who can qualify? Again, straight out of the bill text. The folks on this call are interested in the first line item there. Any organization exempt from tax imposed by subtitle A. That is 501c everything. <laughs> that is 501d everything. That is 401a. That, that, is, that is a lot of stuff. So if you're a C3, you're good. But there's a lot of other things that are also going to qualify. There were state uh, government entities are going to qualify. Tribal government's going to qualify. And as you watch the evolution of the Build Back Better bill, it was interesting to see how things started getting added. So Tennessee Valley Authority popped in there somehow, and then, and then later other things got added. 
Um, I don't know if they have a very good lobby in DC or if it was just an oversight and then somebody added it at the last minute, but, but they got included. And literally like in the last 24 hours, um, rural co-ops got added as well. So that's that's a pretty important, um, you know, a lot of folks get their get their electricity from rural co-ops. So so that got added at the last second too. How is this all going to work? Uh, I've already said we're waiting for guidance. Um, your crystal ball is as good as mine, but I, I want to give you a couple of hints um, for the folks uh, participating on this call. So the bill doesn't say, you know, how it's going to work. It leaves it to the determination of the secretary. But one of the things it did say is when an election is going to be made. So it specifies if you're a government entity, then the secretary is just going to determine, you know, whatever they determine appropriate. For and for folks who don't, you know, file a tax return, um, for folks who do, for everyone else, there's another section that says the due date is going to be when your tax return is due. So if you're a 501c3, your tax return is technically due on you know May 15th, then you have to make this election by May 15th. And by the way, here's this language that says no earlier than 180 days after the date of enactment. So, so it could be more than 180 days. We don't actually know. Well, that creates kind of a timing problem, which I don't think a lot of folks are, are talking about or, or really thinking through. If you have a place and service date, so you're that food bank and you're putting in a solar system, okay, you're waiting till you know 2023. Uh, but if you place that system in service on the first day of your calendar of your fiscal or calendar year, let's say you have a regular calendar year, January to December, you place the system in service on January 1st. Well, you have to wait an entire year until your tax you know year is complete. And then your file, uh, and you're filing, you know, you're due on May 15th. If you're like most nonprofits, you probably get a six month extension. It's automatic. Does anyone actually, maybe that's our next poll question. Does anyone file your returns on time at a 501c3? <laughs> probably not. Uh, and then once you file that return, now you have to wait for a refund. And just as a thought exercise, call up your CPA and ask them for their other clients that have uh, filed like an amended return and they're waiting for a refund check. How long do they have to, to wait? And, and we hear over a year. So there are scenarios here, depending on when you place your system in service and you know when you file, you know, maybe you're super diligent and you file like within a month or two, but it could still take two years, three years maybe in order to get this funding back. So if the secretary implements this through a tax return mechanism, then this could create a gap or a timing problem. Because if you're a nonprofit, you need to pay the solar installer today, but you might not get your, your, your rebate, you know, your, your direct pay credit back for two or three years. That's problematic. Uh, you know, that, that's going to create a, a new need uh, and, and some different thinking about how you're funding your solar project. So do you keep that in mind? Now, you might be saying, well, I'm a church. I don't file a tax return. Yeah, that's probably going to be one of the questions to be answered. It's unclear if the secretary is going to create a separate form. But technically, even if you're a church, if you have what are called unrelated business income tax or UBIT, you're filing a 990T. So you actually do have a tax year. You're, you're just not using it unless you're one of those you know, situations where you have income from things that are outside of your exempt purpose. Uh, and so the IRS does have a tax year for you. They, they just uh, have exempted you from filing that 990 return. So, so stay tuned, you know, how that's going to, how that plays out. Okay. Uh, just to kind of wrap up and repeat some of the higher uh, level points here. If you're going to use direct pay, um, we need to wait for treasury guidance. That's number one. Regardless of how that guidance comes out, there's going to be some, some delay. There, there's going to be a waiting period for, for a refund. That's something to think through. Um, you can't do this yet, even if you, your system is placed in service on January 1st of 2023, because that election uh, is going to be no sooner than 180 days from implementation. 
the phase out period is something to pay attention to for domestic content uh, if your project's over a megawatt. And just to repeat, if all this sounds like a big hassle and too much trouble and you'd rather use transferability, nonprofits are not going to be eligible. So if your backup plan was, I'm going to find a parishioner and just transfer the credits to them and get cash on day one and have no gap, that's not going to be allowed. If you are eligible for direct pay, by definition, there's the, 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 the bill text says you are not eligible for transferability. And transferability in and of itself, we still don't know if it's going to have all those headaches about who can receive that bill credit. Uh, and that you know remains to be seen. Okay, that is a lot of information. Um, and don't worry, we will publish this recording so you can watch it, not 27 hours in a row, uh, I hope, uh, <laughs> but at your leisure. Um, but the takeaway here is that every couple years, you know, this is normal. Every few years, Congress likes to take the tax code, shake it up, make some changes, um, uh, you know, fix some things which are notable, um, which we think are great in this bill add some new things, uh, which are also great, but it's going to introduce new challenges. Um, and, and the good news is we're, we, you know, we're going to come up with new solutions because, because that's what we do to help nonprofits. So keep an eye on this space, but just to give you a preview of what's happening in 2023 and how we're going to address this, you know, one, we're going to have a bridge loan. So to, if you are facing that challenge of that last 30%, and you're not sure how to get you know, over that hurdle, and there's these unknowns about, you know, I don't know if it's gonna take two years or three years, we're, we're, we're gonna have a product designed specifically you know, for, for folks who are in that situation and to deal with that you know, difficulty of the unknown variable of timing. We're also gonna have a three-in-one loan, uh, which is very similar to what we do today for our Sun for All Solar Fund. Uh, today, we're kind of doing a two-in-one loan, which is, the two things are combining a construction loan with a long-term loan. Well, we're gonna add a third thing in there, which is the tax credit bridge loan. So, so now we're gonna have one loan, it's gonna cover you for the construction period, it's gonna cover you for the rebate gap, and it's gonna cover you for the long-term you know, uh, you know, time of the system. And then last, you know, we see a, a window here for a solar lease, which we think would make a ton of sense for folks who don't want that complexity and it's more of an easy button kind of kind of approach. Uh, but if, if your head is spinning right now, like, oh my God, this is too much. Um, <laughs> there, there are lots of easy buttons and approaches and solutions. Uh, and, and we think a solar lease could, could fit that role nicely. So stay tuned to this space. We'll be announcing more details uh, soon. Um, but with that, let's you know talk a little bit about uh, what we can do today. And uh, Nicole, if you wanna take it from there, uh, share more about Absolutely. things we're doing now. Yep, my, my pleasure. So if you let me just throw this out there. If you're a nonprofit who's got the cash to go solar, our, my advice to you is purchase the solar system directly and take advantage of direct pay. 30% is a game changer for your solar project's economics. Um, there's really, I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, if you don't have the cash and you want to discuss funding options, you can benefit from partnering with Collective Sun. That's what we... Uh, started out doing back in 2011. That's what we're continuing to do today, uh, you know, through the many changes that we see over the years. So if if you're looking for technical support, identifying and vetting qualified installers, evaluating project economics, comparing and validating solar proposals, identifying different finance options, whether it's a loan, a lease, the SPA, we can assist you in comparing those options so you can determine the best fit for your organization because it is different for everybody. Um, preparing and supporting you in your board and committee presentations so that you can secure that internal support you need to move forward with your project. We help with all these things. Um, we also help with project management. So there are lots of, of benefits there for nonprofits on a solar journey that can be gained by working and partnering with Collective Sun. Uh, we are here to be your easy button. We keep saying that. That's our theme. Uh, we want to help you navigate the complexities of going solar so that you stay on the path and don't uh, kind of become faced with decision paralysis. It happens to the best of us. 
Um, I just want to throw a little shout out to our nonprofits. You know, nonprofits go solar for more than the financial savings, which is important and it's compelling, but it's their commitment to so much more. So from social responsibility to creation care theology, and it's that kind of passion and commitment that the entire team at Collective Sun celebrates. That's what makes our job so rewarding. So I had to, di I had to I digress. Sorry, I had to go down that path for just a moment, but that is why we do what we do, to make sure that nonprofits have some support in the process. So in addition to the upcoming loan and lease products that we mentioned, uh, we've modified our prepaid service agreement, the SPA. So if that's a, a product you're familiar with, just know that this change, this increase to the ITC, the creation of direct pay, that's impacting the uh, tax market. So we are going to see higher discounts there. So we're used to see a range of a discount between 12 and 16% for a nonprofit. Those discounts now are 16 to 20%. So it's a much more compelling offer for folks who uh, are interested in a prepaid service agreement. Another way that Collective Sun supports nonprofits on their solar journey, again, is through the Sun for All Solar Fund. Uh, if you wouldn't mind advancing that slide, Lee. And, you know, we're the administrators for the Sun for All Solar Fund. So we use values aligned capital, which is funds from our impact investors, like our lead investor, BeQuest Foundation. And those are folks that are seeking to support beneficial social and environmental projects and programs. And we use those funds to provide nonprofit friendly loans. Would you mind advancing again, Lee? Um, loans with low interest rates nonprofit friendly underwriting standards, loans with no collateral requirements beyond the solar system itself. So you can of course reach out anytime to talk with us about how to qualify for the Sun for All Solar Fund. That includes, you know, installers reaching out directly to talk about projects that they're working on with nonprofits. Uh, we're happy to talk with you and let you know if that project meets the um, mission initiatives for Bequest Foundation for the Sun for All Solar Fund program. So additionally, if you are, uh, if you or your foundation are looking for ways to make a difference through impact investing in solar, we encourage you to reach out as well. We can support and help facilitate your commitment to renewable energy as well. And you know, next slide, please. We are here to simplify the process, to de-risk the process for nonprofits. And really, again, we try to be that easy button for folks. And I think, you know, it would help just taking a look at some of the folks we've worked with at the past through Sun for All, uh, United Way, Habitat for Humanity, Vista Community Clinic, San Ysidro Health, San Diego Center for Children. A lot of you will recognize, you know, at least some of these names as nonprofits with uh, names you've heard before. It's great to be part of these projects and to help them find a funding solution that's nonprofit friendly. And that's exactly what Sun for All Solar Fund does. Just so to find out if your organization is the right fit, give us a call. We can answer that question typically on that same phone call. On some occasions, we may need to check in with our funding partner and just get a preliminary uh, pulse from them on, on whether or not the impact is met. But uh, we encourage you to reach out. You can also reach out through collectivesun.com as well. Lee, anything you'd like to add about Sun for All Solar Fund before we move on to Q&A? No, I'm kind of jumping ahead and, and answering some of the Q&A questions right in, awesome. the, in the text. But I think you covered it great. Fantastic. Always an overachiever over there. <laughs> All right. So let me just open that Q&A. And I'm going to take a stab at some questions where you have not put an answer in here. Yeah, these are some really excellent questions, and, and I do want to add as I'm as I'm answering some of them. Um, keep in mind that transferability is only transferability of the ITC, not depreciation. Um, so that that's one thing to consider. Um, and to the question about domestic content, and can can you go into this in in more depth? It it might be helpful to go back and just look at this slide. This is what is considered you know eligible. Uh, for each part to get a made in the USA sticker. And, and my understanding is it's the, at the project level. Um, but I, I would look at, you know, the project has to qualify. Um, not It's all individual parts have to be made in the USA. But, but I would look at Section 661 um, to, to be most instructive and uh, kind of stay tuned to the space uh, as there's 
definitely going to be questions uh, on this from from Treasury. So we may we may uh, sounds like we have a re repeat webinar in the making for a few days after the first round is is released. Uh, first round of uh, guidance is released. I would add. Um, I would expect that to be in piecemeal. It's probably not going to be everything at once. In particular, there's a lot of pressure on the Treasury Department right now to release the labor uh, standard uh, portions because of that 60-day window. Um, so they want to publish that and then provide some guidance there first. And I think we'll see other things kind of trickle, trickle down after that. Excellent. Um, we did have a question about your reference on the slide that's up now, where you have hint 49 CFR part 661. Um, we're, they're actually going to the IRA to reference that. That's the text you're referring to as a- Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, actually, this is a separate section. Just, just Google 49 CFR part 661. Um, it's part of the Federal Register. Uh, and, and you'll get all the details. You can also Google Buy America Requirements, and, and you'll get a lot of kind of articles uh, from there as well. When you, Lee, when you reference Section 45D of the tax code, you were talking about the tax code, right, I should say? Yes, IR, IRC. All right, that was... Internal Revenue Code 45D, Perfect. yeah. Perfect, all right. So, and, yes, go ahead. It's subsection E, I think. Uh, but but if you if you Google, you know, New Market Tax Code, credit map, you're going to get to the same place. That's helpful. Um, so we have a question about the bonus adders. Uh, bonus add, the question reads, the bonus adders are 10% and 20%, but what are they 10% and 20% of? Is that additional tax credit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if your project is $100,000 and you have a 30% ITC, you're getting a 30% tax credit. If you get a 10% bonus adder, that's a 40% tax credit. That means you're getting 40%. So to the person who asked, in theory, could you get a 70% tax credit? Yes, these are stackable. So if you are in a project uh, in an energy community and you're using made in USA products and you're in a low income um, census tract, according to that section 45 D definition, you, you're gonna get a 60% you know, I, ITC. Uh, and if you are in a low income housing, you know, I guess in theory, you could even be as high as 70%. Um, but th these are stackable. Excellent. Um, let's see, I see a question. Would a SOMA project qualify for the bonus 20%? So, um, I will email me uh, for a facts and circumstances specific question, but my reading uh, under the definitions for the 20%, it sounds like it does. Um, it, it sounds like, because the SOMA projects also have some delineation if you're serving tenant or common area load. So, so there might be some specifics on your project, but, but I think that there are some ways to be eligible. Um, so when we get really nitty gritty into facts and circumstances, I'd say, you know, send me a note offline and, you know, we, we can look at individual kind of kind of projects. Uh, moving on to another question here on domestic content, does that include assembly of the equipment? Um, so the way that I read it, uh, it is based on the the cost of the components. And there's some definition if you go to the bill text uh, about being, you know, mined, assembled, uh, you know, constructed in, in the US. Uh, so I would say send me a note with kind of facts and circumstances for what you're thinking about assembling. And I could probably better answer your question. Um, but, but yes, the intention is, is, you know, the made in America is assembled in America, but also using components. And that's why this gets really tricky, because if you do kind of a final assembly, but all of your components are imported from other places, does that still qualify? And, and those are the, the nitty gritty questions that are going to come out in the Treasury uh, guidance process. But there's a ton of good reference material in 661, which is referenced in the bill. The bill says you should make it look like 661, but it doesn't exactly tell the secretary how to 
do you know like specifically it's, it's still at their discretion but i think if history is our guide there's no reason to deviate from established sort of case law and precedent around how this is done uh for for former bills we've seen that had you know buy america requirements in the past uh all right so regarding the one megawatt threshold for labor requirements is that one megawatt ac or dc so great question that is ac and another uh megawatt question here if you're under a megawatt and looking at direct pay do you not need to have domestic content that is correct so the the penalty or the stick of direct pay encouraging people to use domestic content would not apply. However, the carrot still could. I mean, you could be under a megawatt and you could choose to use direct pay uh, and a bonus adder like domestic content, and you could elect to do that and get another 10% bonus adder. Um, so we also have a, a request to list exactly the organization types that can get direct pay. Um, is it easier to list the ones that don't? <laughs> yeah. So sorry, I went over that pretty quickly. Let okay. me repeat it. Um, so if you take the bill text literally, it the first line item is just everybody exempt from subtitle A. But if you look up who's you know exempt from subtitle A, like that's the question you need to ask your CPA. Are we exempt from subtitle A? But I can tell you it is 501C everything. 501c3, 501c4, 501c7, 501d, if you're, um, certain organizations are, are exempt under 501d. Um, there's a couple of others, a 401a exemption. That should cover like 95% of the universe. If you're something outside of that, but you're still tax exempt, you need to go through the process of determining your form of tax exempt if it fits under this definition of exempt from subtitle A. Um, that, that's a more nuanced question. If you wanna send me a note um, or ask your CPA, that, that's probably the way to track it down. For is the there a quick notes version of, or definition of what is subtitle A? It's it's all five chapters of the code. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I mean, there, there was, it's like this huge volume of thousands okay. of pages. There, there was six, but it was redacted. Um, you, uh, for for look for this call, it's all 501c blank. I'm sure that covers pretty much everyone on this call. But if there's specific, you know, facts and circumstances types of questions, you're gonna want to investigate that further. Perfect. Um, all right. So how hard is it to reach the 40% threshold for domestic content? Um, because it sounds like no panels will qualify. Today. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we're on the verge. And if you talk to some domestic manufacturers, they are actually able to source a fair amount. Some things, some of the, like the aluminum frames are sourceable. Uh, I think you can get um, some back sheet EVA. Cells, you cannot today. Um, and you know, it, it's going to be close for many, and it'll be interesting to see who comes out with, you know, the Made in USA sticker and claims their, you know, el eligibility. Uh, I, I think there probably will be some, uh, but if you're importing everything and you're just doing local assembly, like, like you can get J boxes and potting glue and there's, there's stuff you can get from the USA. They now have an incentive to do that. You know, there may be some recertification. Um, glass, I, I don't think I've heard some mixed things. Like, I don't think you can get glass today, but there's some there, there, that may be like really soon. Um, but but you're going to have to ask this question: like, do you qualify under the Buy America requirements? And, and the manufacturer will know what that is, and they're either going to say yes, we do, or no, we don't. And and that's, you know depending on the guidance we get out of treasury that that's going to be determined you know over the next probably six months excellent um can you just confirm we the bonus adders are only available for commercial they are not available for residential projects 
Yeah, so that that is what you know something we consider to be a um, a, a disappointing flaw in the bill. Um, you know, which, which we can also remedy with one of our solar leases. But as it's currently written, these bonus adders are in Section 48, which apply to commercial projects, and not in 25D, which apply to residential projects. Um, but if you are doing residential work and you think there's an opportunity for bonus adders in your you know, geography, uh, send, send us a note uh, because we are interested in speaking with you. We, we have some solutions there as well. Great. Would you mind doing just a brief comparison of how direct pay lines up with um, the ITC, like how they're how they're similar, but how they're different, just to kind of help folks get into this new terminology of direct pay compared to the ITC? Yeah, so it's still an ITC. It's just direct pay is giving you this elective payment where you can raise your hand and say, uh, you know, I, I wish to receive this direct payment in lieu of, you know, the, the sort of ITC. The way that it is implemented for nonprofits, I thought was done really cleverly because the way the bill text was written, it says they'll consider these credits to be used in a trade or business. And so what that triggers is this conversation about UBIT that I mentioned before, where nonprofits are tax exempt as long as they don't have this unrelated income that's not related to their exempt purpose. So for example, if you're your church, and you have a McDonald's in your parking lot, <laughs> you operate a McDonald's, uh, you're gonna be taxed for that income uh, that comes from that McDonald's. However, what this direct pay feature is saying is we're gonna reclassify this credit as being related to a business. So it's like a phantom McDonald's in your parking lot, you're gonna get this credit and the credit's refundable. So that's why I think this could show up on 990T uh, as a form, but nobody knows. It's up to the secretary to decide how it's going to be implemented. But it, the ITC is still the ITC. Direct pay is just this pathway to monetize that, that credit in some way. Before, nonprofits were not eligible to monetize an ITC. Now, they're saying there is a pathway through this elective payment option and how it's implemented that, that's our crystal ball. Uh, I've shared some hints today, you know, uh, for how how I, I think it could be done, uh, what what might happen, but it's it's really unknown, and we should all be prepared for scenarios. You know, they might they might simplify things, they might make things more complicated. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. All right, here's a fun one. It starts out with hypothetical, so brace yourself. All right, <laughs> could a nonprofit builder of low income single family homes or duplexes assume under one megawatt total for this this project be able to take advantage of the direct pay option if they equip the home with solar or solar plus storage and then turn the home and the system over to a low income um, new homeowner yeah so so that's very facts and and yeah. circumstances <laughs> specific um and, and i would say contact me offline but i will say um look if, if you place this in service in 2023, you're eligible for direct pay. And if you place in service in 2023, you're eligible for 100% of direct pay, even if you're over a megawatt. So you're, you're pretty in the clear. Once you go out to 2024, if you're over a megawatt, then you're only get, gonna get 90% unless you use US made panels or, or equipment, unless you are eligible for the domestic content provisions. Uh, if you're under a megawatt and you start in 2024, you're exempt anyway. So you'll still be able to use direct pay. There's this whole wild kind of logic tree, you know, that's sort of forming based on all of these complicated rules. So if you know the specific fact pattern and, and you have a question, like send me an email, talk to your CPA and just hang in there during the next couple months until we get more guidance we, we are all making our best educated guesses about how we think this will play out. Some of it is, you know, pretty, pretty comfortable, well-worn territory, but some of it's in a new space and we, we just don't know. So I, I want to add real quick, there was a comment um, I want to mention that someone mentioned First Solar will be utilizing 100% U.S. glass next year. So, so that's great. Uh, if, if there's already some and there's been announcements for polysilicon and for other upstream components um, that are going to come online. 
they're just not going to happen overnight. They're going to take time uh, to, to be absorbed. And over time, as we see more of these domestic manufacturing enterprises come online, that's why you see you know, the, the matching in this slide that they're going to ratchet up. It's going to become easier and easier over time to be able to qualify for the domestic content requirements. And I, I notice with our time here, uh, we may oh, be going a minute over. Time flies when you're having fun. I guess, I guess so. There's so many great questions, and thank you for sending these. I, I noticed we did not have time to get to everything, so we'll go back. We have these recorded, and we can answer these questions and then send them out, uh, presumably, to all the regist registrants. Yes, exactly. Um, That's the plan. And uh, get all these questions answered for you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you, Lee and Nicole. This has been great information. I can't wait to see everything that comes through for more questions. Thanks again for everyone for joining us. Look forward to uh, chatting with you soon about even more new changes coming up. Have a Happy good day. Thursday.